All right. So as Jason said, it would be great if we could do this in person. And I can't wait at some point in the future to do this again in person, but really want to make the, the most of your time in a virtual way. So just as Jason said, we'll have a couple polls throughout. And I'm going to be talking about this, this topic of governance. And I wrote a paper with uh, another author. My co-author is Courtney Brammer, and she heads up cybersecurity case studies. And I really want to uh, put a plug in for her up top. Uh, she has a fantastic website. She maintains a library of cybersecurity case studies where if you, if you want more information around uh, things like loss amounts and how those are tied, to specific uh, cyber breaches. She has a fantastic library that she has uh, curated over the years. So she is not here today, but she's here in spirit. So we are going to talk about the nine ways that enterprises mismanage their cyber risk. And I, I think for a lot of you, uh, you'll probably look at this and say, you know, yes, you know, some of this makes sense and maybe some of it doesn't. Uh, but I think the, the key is you know, agreeing and disagreeing on the problems and then also the solutions as we go through it. So the first thing I wanna, I wanna point out here is that when we talk about uh, cyber risk management, we have to sort of, I think, fundamentally step back and acknowledge that this is really a moonshot in that there is so much technical complexity within enterprises today. And we're, we're dealing with adversaries that have near limitless resources and focus. So, if, if an enterprise is going to have a, a fighting chance, sort of regardless of industry vertical, um, good digital governance has to sort of underpin everything that happens within the organization. And we'll talk about it a little bit more, but cognitive dissidence is what I sort of call this, this situation that tends to afflict so many organizations. And just for a background before we get into it, so uh, Courtney and I wrote this paper and you can download it from uh, either Courtney's site or Recorded Future site uh, for more details. And this is really the overview of it. And the background is that um, we are really fortunate at Recorded Future. We have hundreds of, of global clients and I was able to talk to a lot of CISOs. I also come from an information security background. I used to run threat intelligence at a financial services company. Uh, I worked in the, in the public sector, in the private sector. And um, you know, Courtney comes from a, a risk and governance background. So we really had a, a, a great sort of process in, in talking to a lot of people, both in sort of GRC functions, in, in senior management functions, and then operational security functions, and, and sort of bringing this all together. So what is governance right? at, at a high level? This is a, a definition that I think came out of an H, a Harvard Business Review article in 2004, if I'm not mistaken. And I may have, I may have the attribution wrong in terms of where it first appeared. But I really like the definition of this. And I think, you know, we all tend to kind of throw around the term governance and it's sort of in our heads, I think, sort of equates to government. Uh, and there's obviously this concept of who has the authority, who has the decision rights, you know, who's accountable. Um, obviously, if, if you're a fan of racy charts, right, racy charts get very granular on, you know, who's responsible to do something and who has the authority to do something. But it's really the second half of this definition that I think is so important for governance is that in order to do it right, it means that we're really encouraging uh, the desirable behaviors with IT and with technology inside of our organizations. And if we don't get governance right, essentially this is, this is the fundamental problem is that we're, we're sort of short circuit, we're short circuiting the desirable behavior part of this. And that's really what, what governance is all about. So let's jump into the nine points here. So the first point, is that there is this um, overarching responsibility on CISOs today to determine not just how much their enterprise should expect to spend on security, but also sort of convince their respective governance functions to approve that spend. And if, if there's inaction here, there can be obviously considerable financial losses. And we've just put you know, a couple up here from, from the paper. This is obviously just a sample. Obviously, history is, is littered with uh, companies that have financial losses from some sort of cyber event. And when we, when Courtney and I kind of looked at this, we said, you know, would auditors ever suggest an approach based on these type of numbers, these type of, you know, overarching loss numbers? And we think it's, it's doubtful. 
right? That the current corporate governance approach is the decisions are really made too conservatively. The frame of reference is just too conservative, uh, both fiscally and technologically. And we think that, you know, for a lot of board of directors, there's still uh, a leap of faith required to invest in security sort of, you know, beyond that audit function. And when you think about things in sort of just the budget keeping mindset, it sort of missed the fact that a lot of these costs are not always constrained to financial. Right? There can be significant repercussions, uh, whether it's businesses that actually go out of business or whether it actually impacts the, the health and safety and well-being of, of other humans, right, where people are actually dying because of some of these events. Um, it, it can be uh, pretty disastrous and actually exceed, you know, just financial losses. And then, of course, if you bring in the COVID-19 sort of paradigm and you think about how many people, you know, work remotely and then how many people will actually go back to an office and how many will stay uh, in remote work, it sort of gives a lot of these types of decisions um, much more urgency. And oftentimes it's difficult when the board says, you know, are we spending enough money? Uh, to to answer that in a way right that's going to be uh, helpful and that's going to sort of be underpinned by data and 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 evidence. So that we put more examples in the paper. These are just uh, more examples of kind of what we were talking about. And in the paper, in the information security realm, obviously we talk about things generally sort of left of boom, right of boom. So things that are happening uh, before an actual unauthorized access event occurs, and then what happens after the initial unauthorized access. And in the paper, we sort of, you know, we give the high level threat category that sort of led to the initial unauthorized access and then what happened subsequent to that, as well as uh, what the fines were and, and some of the details around the losses. And obviously some of these losses are around uh, regulatory. Some of these are related to insurance. You know, some of it is just the loss of operations inside of the organization like Sony. And we've just kind of put some of the more well-known examples in, in this type of chart. But again, it, it, they're helpful data points to sort of help board of directors understand uh, what the repercussions can be if, if there's underinvestment in, in security. So the second point here is that it can be very slow, even if you decide that, okay, we're not spending enough or, or you know, we need to spend more in a particular area around security controls. It's very difficult to move quickly when everything is done by committee and you have to build a consensus. And I know this firsthand from my own experience in an enterprise organization that even when there is agreement within, you know, multiple, uh, multiple teams and, and maybe even the GRC function, to actually get a committee together and approve the spend, maybe that committee only meets every quarter. That is that is really tough because as we know, adversaries move quickly, right? They don't wait for the quarterly budget meeting to approve additional security spend for some sort of control. So there can be cognitive dissonance here where some folks in the organization will say, well, if a breach hasn't happened to us, then we don't necessarily need to spend more on controls. And obviously SolarWinds and Microsoft Exchange vulnerabilities and all the various dominoes that have been falling in the last you know, month or two months would really suggest otherwise. Um, when you look at kind of how um, cyber risk gets escalated to these relevant committees, you know, it, it could be self-identified by a business unit via you know, an internal risk assessment it could be identified proactively or even reactively by the information security team based on some sort of external or, or internal event. It could get escalated through an audit action point, you know, identified in, in their review, but that's often after you know, the issue materialized that prompted the review. It could be highlighted by a, regula regula a regulator's finding. Um, they're naturally reactive. Um, so there's a lot of different ways these things can get surfaced. But the problem is how fast can you move as an organization uh, once, once you have identified that issue or that control gap? So one interesting example we bring up in the paper is that Maersk is obviously you know, an example of pretty significant financial losses when they were hit with NotPetya in 2017. But what's interesting, you know, sort of a couple months prior is that in May of 2017, the National Health Service in the UK was hit with a very large scale disruption via WannaCry. 
And, you know, the, the NHS subsequently invested $150 million in new security controls. And so you, you can sort of step back and ask the question, of course, it's very easy to sort of Monday morning quarterback these things. You know, why didn't Mayor sort of learn from the NHS incident and, and the losses that were incurred from that incident? You know, why didn't they spend on security controls, you know, sooner rather than later, having sort of observed that before they got hit with not patch in? So I think right now we have a survey question on this. You know, do you think that two and a half months or three months is enough time to invest to, and actually make the necessary control changes? You know, yes or no? And it looks like, you know, most of you are saying no. A couple of you, maybe, it looks like one uh, says it wouldn't have mattered, but the overwhelming majority of you 12 are saying, no, it, it would not have mattered. So I think the interesting question is, is that because everything is driven by consensus, right? And it does take a long time to spin up that machine, um, you know, or, or are there other reasons for it? And we can get to some of that during, during Q&A, but overwhelmingly you're saying no. Um, with four of you saying maybe. So that's interesting, the four of you there that are saying may, maybe there. Okay, so moving on, um, the, the second part of this is that there are there's obviously a focus on audit compliance, right? And when we work inside of an enterprise, if, if, we, if we miss or fail on audit compliance, there are obviously significant repercussions that are, are, that are quite unpleasant. So we have to succeed on audit compliance, obviously. But the, the, the piece of this that's interesting is that there's generally a perception that if you do audit compliance well, um, that you're also sort of taking care of operational risk and sort of reducing operational risk. And what we think is that ideal digital governance really means that senior management and the budget committees, if they're necessary, have visibility into both audit compliance, but also IT risk management, because they're two very different things. And this is my ugly Venn diagram here and sort of the way that I think about it is that you do get some coverage when you do audit compliance well, but there is so much more that is happening inside the adversary space that is not necessarily going to be um, covered or achieved just by audit compliance. So in April of 2018, for example, a weak authentication credentials at Erie County Medical Center resulted in a ransomware attack. And the medical center was relieved that they had taken heed of their auditor's suggestion to increase cyber insurance coverage from 2 million to 10 million prior to that ransomware attack. So just an example of where audit is, is helpful. And, and we're not saying that you know, audit is, is not helpful and doesn't add value because they do. A second example would be the Folksom Group in November of 2020 disclosed they had been accidentally allowing technology companies to access customers' private data. And it was actually the internal auditors that uncovered the unauthorized access. So th there is plenty of value that audit brings. That, and we're not saying that that's not the case. But there's so much uh, cyber risk that it exceeds audit visibility. And cyber threats evolve daily, as you all know. And it's really about sort of control validation, which is, you know, from the audit side, you may do a quarterly penetration test because you need to do that to satisfy audit compliance, but in, in, in actually paralleling what adversaries are doing means that you actually need to do control validation on a much more frequent basis to understand where you have gaps, right? And where you actually have risk. And, you know, that, that is something that, you know, requires resources to, to do something like that. And ultimately, when you're trying to communicate risk, it can be difficult if everything gets distilled down into red, yellow, green, high, medium, low. It, it is difficult uh, for, for senior decision makers to understand what that actually means in terms of uh, future loss. So we all are familiar with likelihood of occurrence times impact, but you have to actually be doing a lot more within operational risk uh, to understand where you have gaps in your control set and what that means in terms of risk and, and ultimately loss. So on this one, we have uh, another survey question. Um, you know, it, from your perspective, is the board interested in spending on security beyond audit compliance, right? Or 
a lot of what I've heard from CISOs lately is, listen, if we solve for the board's perspective is if we solve for audit compliance and we have a good cyber insurance policy in place, then why would we spend more resources, right? Maybe they don't come out and say it. Why would we spend more resources on reducing cyber risk if, if we're covered on audit compliance and we have a good insurance policy? I need to stop for another five seconds or so, Levi. Come on, folks. There's more, more than that in this session. Get involved. Five, four, three, two, one, and there you go. Interesting. So 13 of you said uh, not spending enough. Uh, four of you said 18% said overspending on the wrong tools. And 23% said cyber insurance is sufficient. So that's actually, I think, the most interesting part is 23% of you said cyber insurance is sufficient. And I think that's really, you know, the board's perspective, maybe not everywhere right now, but a lot of boards, I think that is the perspective that, listen, as long as we're, we're passing our audits and, and we have that insurance policy, then, you know, really what's the point, right? I mean, I open up the newspaper, I open, I read the headlines, I read what's going on in the world. And it's, you know, literally every day, another organization, another breach, um, another supply chain compromise, um, another massive vulnerability, right? That's impacting tens or hundreds of thousands of organizations. So why are we going to sink more money into this uh, beyond what we sort of, you know, need to do to to cover ourselves? And it's an interesting sort of it's an interesting sort of argument. And I would I would love to hear counter perspectives on it. So just as an example, when I talk about control validation and what I mean about, you know, sort of moving beyond just quarterly penetration tests is understanding what adversary tools and techniques and, and procedures are and being able to not only surface those TTPs and those TTP evolutions, but then also being able to do regular programmatic, whether it's red team, blue team exercises, whether it's a programmatic control validation, getting to the point where you can say, we've identified that evolution in the adversary's TTPs. We have identified where our security controls do have gaps, whether it be you know, network-based, host-based, policy-based, whatever it is. Uh, and we have identified these gaps and we are remediating these gaps, remediating gaps, and this is what it does to the risk picture. So just, just examples of what adversary TTPs look like there. So point number three is really getting the organizational alignment correct with where CIOs report into. And I think it's, you know, it's interesting looking at the Equifax breach specifically, um, there was some movement and some shifting around uh, from 2005 onward before the, the breach happened at Equifax. And it was interesting that of course the CISO was reporting into the chief legal officer uh, at the time that the breach happened and the chief legal officer had really no background in information security at all or experience. Um, just kind of an interesting data point there. But we think that the reporting structure should really, again, to the governance aspect here, right? The solution is making sure that you have incentives that are aligned. And oftentimes there is misalignment in the incentives between the technology enablement mission from the CIO and then reducing operational risk from the CISO or the CSO. So we actually talked to some folks uh, in a SOC who used to work in a SOC and they basically said, look, you know, as, as a, a former SOC manager, the job was basically remediating security incidents as quickly as possible so that the information never escalated to the CIO, right? And that's, that's a terrible sort of frame of reference to think about um, how you want your organizational structure to, to, to work. So, you know, on, on the poll, who do you, or if you're not a CI or CSEO in your organization, who do they report to, right? Is it the CIO? Is it a chief risk officer? Is it a chief operating officer, chief financial officer, um, chief legal officer? You know, what is it? Um, we think that having a CISO or a CSO report to someone, um, whether it be, you know, a chief operating officer, chief financial officer, um, but, you know, someone where there is, it, parallel visibility, right? That there is a, a um, senior seat at the table, right? And that there is equal visibility uh, as a peer of the CIO is really going to be most beneficial for actually 
uh, reducing risk and, and setting up the proper governance. So 74% of you say the CISO reports to the CIO today. And I think, you know, that is the default standard. I think most organizations that, you know, we work with, that is the construct. But we think that the solution here is probably going to, the paradigm is going to change over time um, as more visibility is required. Again, going back to the Equifax breach, um, the CISO was never involved in the CEO's uh, monthly senior meetings um, and, and just never had that, that kind of input or visibility, which again is, is a mistake from our perspective. So along the same topic, uh, number four here, it's very difficult from everything that, that we heard uh, from different teams, there is a natural tension between the governance risk and compliance groups and the operational security teams. And a lot of that seems to be that, you know, G, the perception is that GRC is only concerned with passing audits, you know, whether it be SOCs or SOC2, whatever it may be, and that the operational security teams tend to be very aloof. They lack patience to explain technical security concepts or strategies. And there's usually a division in reporting structures, which really exacerbates these problems where, again, you have operational security teams reporting into a CISO that probably reports to a CIO. And then you have uh, a, a governance risk and compliance groups that generally you know, report into something like a chief uh, risk officer or, or, or chief legal officer. So we think the solution here is really better aligning, again, incentives and motivations in the enterprise where you have um, better alignment just through uh, reporting structures for both the operational security teams and the governance risk and, comp and compliance teams so that you, know, you are accomplishing what you want to accomplish. Um, and, and it's not just about, well, one team needs a certain piece of information to do their job and this other one you know, is gonna do their own thing that you're really working uh, together and that there's more mutual respect for, for both teams. So the other part of that is that the IT groups that support operational security, if operational security um, organizationally is, is combined with GRC or in the same sort of um, group, that the technology folks within IT are still supporting uh, what operational security team members need, right? And that, whether it's you know, setting up SIMs or creating databases or whatever it may be, obviously that technical enablement still is gonna be super important to get that right. So the survey question on, on this is, have you observed GRC teams and operational security teams that work well together, right? And, and that could be you know, the incident response team, it could be the SOC, it could be the vulnerability management team, security architecture, you know, whatever it may be, you know, but is, is this consistent with your experience or is it traditionally just so fundamentally different in terms of, of mission in the way the organization is set up? Uh, you know, what, what are you seeing? So we have uh, one, one response, 6% that says never. And we have 71%, 12 of you saying rarely. So I think that's really the takeaway is that, you know, this is mirroring what you're seeing is that uh, for the majority of you, you know, GRC and operational security that does not work well. And this is actually, you know, one of the, the largest problems, I think, uh, that hinders right, good governance and good risk outcomes in the enterprise because there is such a, a misalignment here. And it's a, it's a huge opportunity, I think, for CEOs and, and others at the, at the C-level to think about how to do this better, right, to, to achieve better outcomes. So number five, uh, compliance does not necessarily mean that you are reducing operational risk. And I think, you know, we, we've talked about this uh, a little bit before, but a lot of times what happens inside of compliance is, well, we have a framework and we need to increase our maturity around that framework, right? Whether it's NIST, whether it's the, the, the cybersecurity framework, whether it's ISO, whatever it is, what can happen over time is that there is this check the box mentality that starts to pervade the, the organization. And by that, I mean, if the, if the framework calls for setting up a firewall, you can set up a firewall, but if you don't properly tune it, if, if, and if you don't uh, set the proper rules, then it's, it's kind of meaningless, right? And if at the same time, you know, the framework says, well, you need a 24 by seven SOC, but you outsource it or you create a SOC and it's not staffed with 
the appropriate people that have the appropriate technical skills, then you can check the box and say, you know, yeah, you know, we installed the firewall, we installed the IDS, you know, we've got multi-factor authentication, you know, we've got the SOC. But if, if you're not actually focused on um, the efficacy of what you're doing and how it reduces operational risk, then you're in trouble. The other problem with the frameworks is that these frameworks only update every 18 to 24 months, if you're lucky, um, and they're outdated, right, by the time they, they're updating. So um, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with the frameworks. They're great tools in the tool belt, but the, the point of it can't just be about, you know, we're gonna increase maturity and we're gonna check all the boxes and be compliant because as we know, history is littered with organizations that were certified compliant right before they got breached and right before they had a major cyber event. So I think it's, it's really important just to surface this point that you wanna be focused on measurable risk reduction, right? in addition to the tool sets that you're using around a compliance framework. And really what we think you know, that's most important is that executives and the board of directors especially, that they really have two real-time views into what's happening here. So one is audit compliance, obviously very important, but the other is cyber risk management. And again, they're not always the same thing. So having a near real-time view into both of these areas becomes really, really important. All right, we didn't have a survey question on that one. Okay, number six. Um, what we are finding is that CEO engagement is really critically important uh, to achieving success around risk reduction. Gardner says that by 2024, 75% of CEOs will be personally liable for cybersecurity incidents. And obviously removing a CEO can have all kinds of do negative domino effects. Um, there have been a couple of instances of CEOs being removed. Obviously, you're probably aware of, of most of them uh, following right, major, major, major cyber events. And the solution here is, you know, CEOs have to be more engaged in cyber governance. And it is so important to the organizational success. Um, again, you know, not to harp on Equifax, but um, a really stark example of where the CEO really had no visibility into what was going on uh, within information security. And, you know, that was, that was a, a fundamental failing, in my opinion, of, of what transpired there. So the survey question here is, you know, is your CEO regularly engaged in cyber risk management? And if so, you know, how often? Numbers are moving, numbers are moving. This is great. I'm gonna leave this up for another 15, 10, we'll go 10 seconds from here, 10, nine. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three. This is great. We almost two, have a tie. Get one. your votes in. <laughs> yeah, we got one more. Oh, that was there great. Go. Oh, we go. got two more. <laughs> that was good stuff. So we we almost had a, a tie there exactly between quarterly and rarely. So that's that's quite a spread. And I think you know there's uh, ten percent said daily. 3% weekly, 10% monthly, and then 38% quarterly, 34% rarely, 3% not at all. I think, you know, that spread between rarely and quarterly uh, is pretty telling. And I think, you know, CEOs are, are going to start catching on here uh, if, if they haven't already. But obviously, this becomes really, really important, again, to, to the success of the actual business over time. So number seven. I feel very passionately about this topic. Um, I, I recently put out a, a short book uh, on this topic. You can download it from Recorded Future in, in soft copy form. If you wanna read the PDF, you can order it on, on Amazon. But I have had a lot of experience in the enterprise where again, going back to the heat maps, it really wasn't clear to me what we were communicating and how we expected people to interpret it, right? Again, whether it's high, medium, low, red, yellow, green, when you talk about cyber risk, in qualifiable terms, it's just very difficult to make decisions. So enterprise executives often make bad control investment decisions because they do it based on bad data or they don't really understand what the heat map means. So it's hard to sort of communicate a degree of you know, relative risk urgency based on those qualitative assessments. As you know, not every threat poses a risk to your organization. Right? You have superseding controls in place that mitigate many of these threats. They're not actually risks. 
So it's really important from our perspective to be able to quantify risk. And what this means at the end of the day is, are we going to lose money? And if so, how much? Right? That's the fundamental question, regardless of whether you're talking about a hit to the stock price, whether you're talking about repu reputational loss, whether you're talking about an operational outage, you know, whatever it is, it all boils down. In the end, it all boils down into numbers. Right? And that's really what risk quantification is, is all about. So again, we talked about control validation and understanding your gaps, right? And, and doing that, you start to, um, start to quantify your risk. There's a lot of frameworks out there like FAIR. Uh, I have a, a one in the book that is sort of FAIR light, very practical, called Threat Category Risk. And it's designed to be very practical. But again, if you put sort of junk into a formula, you get junk out of a formula. Um, and the, the key here is that there are many data points external to your organization in terms of loss. Um, and then also looking at likelihood, you don't have to come up with the exact numbers. You can come up with ranges, um, a, a high and a low, and you can, you can do all kinds of, of meaningful things with that type of data. Um, if, if we think about kind of some of the pervasive attitudes that happen inside the enterprise, you know, one is, hey, once that security event materializes, I'm going to get the budget that I requested, which is a reactionary approach to risks, obviously waiting for something to happen that's going to cause harm um, to get the resource that you need is, you know, is a terrible feeling. And then it's the other side is, well, if I self-identify with the risk within a risk assessment, they, they may expect me to solve this issue without additional budget. But if I wait for audit to find it, then I'll get the extra budget budget. And if audit misses it, well, how could we have possibly known about it? And that's just pushing the problem down the road. So, you know, we think that this is so important and, and getting, again, getting GRC on the same page with how you quantify cyber risk is so important because even if you come up with a model that you like and all of your, your variables are transparent, your assumptions are transparent, you know, GRC, when they when they quantify other types of risk, business risk, geopolitical risk, whatever it may be, you know, it can be different. And so getting everyone on the same page inside the organization to say, this is the way that we're going to talk about cyber risk. This is how we're going to quantify it. This is how we're going to measure it. This is how we're going to communicate it becomes really important and really critical. Uh, no, there are no perfect models out there, but just starting somewhere can be really, really powerful, again, to help people make uh, better informed decisions and understand how their decisions are actually going to reduce risk in a measurable way. So on the, on the poll here, 28% of you said, yes, you are quantifying cyber risk. 33% uh, of you said yes, but poorly. And then another 33% of you said, no, um, don't have the necessary tools, resources. And, and that really seems to be the majority there in the responses is that's pretty good. So five of you said, yes, you are. And then 12 of you said, uh, yes, but poorly or no, don't have the, the necessary tools and resource. And I think this is one evolution that you're going to see really accelerate in the coming years is the emphasis on uh, risk quantification and doing this in, in a practical way, uh, where today I think there's a lot of organizational resistance because it, the perception is it can be hard, um, when in reality, you know, it doesn't have to be hard. But I think, you know, Historically, there has been some resistance to this because, frankly, it's just the way it's always been done, right? To sort of try and qualify things instead of quantify them. So number eight is around security awareness. And when you think about how collective ownership, you know, we call this a collective ownership approach to cyber governance, there's really four roles. So there's a preventative role, for example, you know, not clicking on a phishing link, right, is preventative. There's a detective role. So if, if you identify uh, somebody opening, opening files that they don't have a business need to, to open and escalating that observation, that's a, that's a detective role. Uh, there's a corrective role, right, which is um, resetting passwords after some sort of cyber event. That's, that would be corrective. Or directive, right, which is rewarding individuals within a team when they practice good security hygiene. So the collective approach is a good approach in in that you know everyone becomes responsible on the front lines for the security of the organization and you're effectively trying to make people an asset um, 
you know, in that process. But threat actors also look at this as everyone's an asset, right? Working at home, their own computers, their own phones, and so forth. Uh, everyone becomes a target. And this is really, you know, an opportunity to think through how you're going to do training, how you're going to increase uh, awareness, and how you're going to inform the collective security approach, really empower them to act well beyond the scope of just you know, your traditional compliance training where everyone has to watch the security video for four hours and answer some questions, right? It's really an opportunity to, if you create a powerful, engaging uh, security training that's going to help people in their personal lives, then that's going to translate over into the professional world and, and, and the corporate side as well. And if you think about what is, well, okay, what is the alternative to not doing this? You know, the alternative is basically uh, overt or, or covert surveillance of employee activities. And ultimately we think, you know, that diminishes trust across the company and it's counterproductive to, you know, collectively motivating employees to try and help detect and subvert cyber attacks. So the quality of the training and, and the quality of how you equip people is really sort of critical to the collective governance approach here. Went back too far there. So this brings us to number nine. And number nine, again, goes back to the earlier point that the board really does need that that uh, that view, the two different sides of the view, right? And and that's what are, how are we doing in audit compliance and how are we doing with operational security risk? And what is what do those pictures look like? And you, because of the technical complexity, just thinking about asset inventories in, in, in an enterprise is mind boggling sometimes. You cannot do this with some, something like a proof of concept risk register in an Excel spreadsheet and hire a couple of interns to sort of run this. Like that's, that is not going to work. Right? There has to be um, some pretty significant uh, technical resources brought to bear to actually be able to achieve this uh, so that the board, for example, you know, can, can look at either one of these views whenever they need to. So we talked to one GRC veteran and she described sort of the, the process of, of doing a control inventory. You know, they outsource it to a consulting firm. The consulting group came in and said, okay, well, you've got, you know, X number of critical business processes and you've got to implement 900 controls, right? That, that need to map into those. And it's just sort of mind boggling to think about the complexity there. And ultimately they were able to get that list down to 256 controls just to satisfy the audit and regulatory requirements. Um, but again, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're reducing uh, cyber operational risk in the ways that you think you are, just, just mapping those controls to the GRC side. So to constantly be validating large numbers of security controls and to be able to translate that into quantitative loss figures really is going to require a lot of automation. Like you have to bring technology to bear on this. You, you, you really can't do it uh, without some, some significant uh, technology applications. So one of the folks that we talked to is a, a senior security director and they sustained a denial of service attack that actually took the company's e-commerce site offline. And you know, after the attack, there were all kinds of questions like, you know, what type, what does this type of attack cost us as a company? How much does a new control cost to mitigate these types of denial of service attacks in the future? What's the probability that we're going to sustain another denial service attack this year? How often this year do we need a business process change? If you don't have automation in place, these questions can take a long time to answer. Uh, so building real-time risk views really helps you just ensure stronger governance kind of across the board. So that's a lot of talking. I really appreciate um, all of the input and the engagement on the surveys. Um, this is my email address. Uh, you can you can always email me, find me on LinkedIn, find me on Twitter. Uh, I'd love to talk about any of these concepts around uh, better governance and all of the things that sort of roll up into that. But I really appreciate your time and attention. Jason, thank you so much. No worries at all. We got some questions to get to. So let's not delay and let's get some. But thank you very much for uh, running through that, Levi. I've just put Levi's email in there as well guys, for those who want it. Um, quick, very, very quick one. Um, did have a request for the uh, paper that you put together with Courtney and even a request for Courtney's info. Um, so wonder if we can share that with the attendees following the session. Yeah, absolutely. And I apologize, I don't have her email address in front of me, but if you just send me an email, 
to Levi at recordedfuture.com. I will, I will um, not, not just send you her contact info. I'll, I'll make an intro if that's better for you, but I'll definitely get you her contact info. Brilliant. Um, Sean Kavanagh asks, what is your take on cybersecurity insurance and paying the ransoms if proof of life can be established? It's such a tough topic right now. You know, I think there's a lot of change happening within the cyber insurance market. I think, you know, underwriting standards are changing. I think the way that insurance companies are viewing policies is changing. And th there's a lot that's in flux right now. There's a really good HBR article on this topic uh, just published a couple of weeks ago. I think, you know, it's very easy. I'm former federal law enforcement. It's very easy to sort of put my, my law enforcement hat on and say, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to incentivize the behavior anymore. You know, we, we don't want to encourage these actors and these groups to, you know, continue the ransomware attacks. But at the end of the day, it's a business decision. And I think it's, it's, it's completely valid. Even putting, you know, the Department of Treasury and, and, and all of their guidance on paying ransoms aside for a second, I think is very valid, you know, to make a business decision and say, you know, we, uh, don't have alternative recourse. We don't have uh, the resources that we need to to rebuild our systems or rebuild our databases. And you know, this is a reasonable business decision. And I think that that is legitimate. I, I don't think that anybody can throw stones at, at, at making a decision like that because every situation is different. That's fair enough answer. Um, so you obviously mentioned about CISOs. You know becoming more prominent and having more of an important role in the organization just in terms of well reporting structure and also actually being in uh, in the in the boardroom i suppose yep. know that there's a number of secure execs in the audience who's would nodding along saying yes please at that point um the question did come in from jason torres and how do you handle the situation when our cyber security and it budget has been eliminated and moved to zero dollars based budgeting how do we win the fight with a c-suite that's a great question. That's a, um, I, so it's, <laughs> I'm, 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 it's, it's not funny. I'm chuckling because I've been in, I've been in that situation. I've been in very similar situations, not where the budget got eliminated to zero, but just thinking about, you know, the difficulty of articulating this. And again, I, I think it does come back to uh, being able to quantify risk. And I think it's, it's very difficult to have these conversations absent the risk quantification piece, because I think, you know, going in and, and, and saying, look, you know, this is our situation today where, you know, we project losses this year of X, right? And this is why, right? We, we don't have these resources, human or technical or otherwise. And, and because of that, because of the gaps, right? This is, th these are the losses that the business is, is, you know, potentially looking at this year. And, if you're not, if, if you're comfortable with that, then okay, right? There's really nothing left to say. But if you're not comfortable with these probabilities, if you're not comfortable with, you know, a 70% 70, 70 probability of losing a hundred million dollars this year or whatever it is, and they say, well, you know, how'd you come up with those numbers, right? You obviously have to be able to explain your model and you have to be able to explain, you know, how you arrived at these things. But ultimately I think that really gets people attention in a different sort of way than, well, we really need these resources because if we don't get them, bad things are going to happen, right? And it's like, well, yeah, we have a cyber insurance policy. Like, we're not going to invest any more money in this. It really, when you're able to talk in dollars and cents, you're able to talk about probabilities and losses. It becomes a much more tangible conversation that tends to get people's um, attention. And I think, again, you know, you can use Courtney and her case studies to say, look, you know, these are three other companies in our same industry vertical that over the past five years have sustained, you know, losses of X, Y, and Z. And we do not have the resources. We do not have the controls. We do not have the programs in place uh, that are going to mitigate any of those losses. So our losses are going to be the same or worse. Right? And I think those are the types of conversations that tend to move the needle versus sort of anecdotal qualified narratives, right? It's, 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 it's just, and it's not about fear, uncertainty, and doubt. It's not about fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and having you know those kinds of exaggerative conversations. It's just a very matter of fact conversations about probabilities and losses. Mm. There's a comment actually that came in here, which kind of resonates with what you're saying. Um, Kevin from Patricia Miller just saying this is more of a comment, but there needs to be more storytelling about the breaches and the impact to operations and finance. Absolutely, um, that resonates with the CEO who may lack some cybersecurity knowledge. 
essentially. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think if the, I think the art of storytelling is critical at that level uh, and being able to do it in a concise way and then sprinkling in to that story, right? Those loss amounts is so important. I couldn't agree more. Definitely. Um, got time for two more questions here, guys. We're running, but I want to cover, cover one coming from Kirk Quack, which is just, would compliance and risk being integrated as one be an efficient model? I think so. I, I think so. I think, you know, the big question is where does operational security sit in relation to compliance and risk? And I think, you know, we found that almost always, you know, there's a chasm there and there's a split. And I think, I think if you are in an organization that can be forward leaning and can think about these issues in different ways, that there is absolutely an opportunity to move operational security over into compliance and risk. Again, ensuring that IT is still going to support them, and just because they're not in the CIO umbrella, um, that there is still going to be support there. But I think that sort of organizational alignment is going to be so much more helpful to what the the company is actually trying to achieve. Fantastic. And the final question: um, I've heard this asked many, many, many times. But in your opinion, what percentage of IT budget should be focused on cybersecurity? Yeah, it's it's a great question, and it's it's interesting. You know, I used to work at a a Fortune 500 uh, financial, and you know they were spending billions, right, on security, billions, and and that was you know a piece of the larger billions IT budget, and you know obviously there are no there are no silver bullet answers on how much, and obviously when you go into the board, you know the first question you get from the board is always, are we spending enough on security, right? And it's like again, you know anecdotally that's impossible to answer and it's it's almost always a trap right and I, again i think it comes back to bring the conversation back to probabilities and loss right are you comfortable with a 30 percent probability of losing 100 million dollars this year are you comfortable with a 10 percent probability of losing it even more right? are you comfortable with a 70 percent probability of losing you know 50 million dollars those are the questions right you want to turn it right back around right the question is not how do we, you know, put our finger up in the air and say, oh yeah, you know, we're spending, we're spending a hundred million on security and our competitor, you know, across the way here is spending, you know, 110 million on security. That means nothing, right? It's all about how much money we're going to lose and are we comfortable with that? And if we're not comfortable with it, what do we need to do to move the needle, right? What do we need to do to invest and what does that investment return in terms of risk reduction? So I think that's, that's the mindset that we all have to get into, which is flipping the question back around and saying, what are you comfortable with from a risk perspective? Are you comfortable with these kind of probabilities and loss amounts? Are, and, and if you're not, let's talk about what we need to do and what we need to spend to get there. Right? And that, that's a very different paradigm, a very different type of conversation. It's such a great question to ask back, though, to, to kind of flip it. I think it's, it's a fantastic way of doing it. So thank you very much. Well, that brings us to the end of the session, um, purely because I need to reset for the next one, guys. So just want to uh, ask the audience and joining me in a virtual round of applause for Levi. Um, fantastic insight there.